equipped for the last days. Equipped for the last days. So let's begin with just one little scripture from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. How many love the Word of God today? Amen? Amen. I know usually we don't like to have an exhaustive Bible study message on a Sunday morning, but I think when I was praying last week, the Lord just kind of brought this to my spirit because perhaps we have people in the church family who aren't familiar with the the basic ideas of the last days. Today we're going to deal with some of those and kind of ask ourselves some questions about where we are relative to the end times. You guys ready? Come on, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here we go. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7 just says this. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. One more time. Will you say this out loud with me? Ready? Go. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Let us have a prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you so much for the great privilege that I have this morning to share in your word with your people. God, I thank you for the promises associated with the era in which we live. And God, I pray that your word penetrate our hearts and our minds today, teaching us, showing us, exhorting us, toward our next steps of maturity, our next steps of engagement with you in your presence and your word. Because Father, we need your word. We rely upon your word. And Lord, we love your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to answer five questions to help us be better equipped for the last days. So let's go. Here we go. Question number one. We're going to get right into the word this morning. Question number one, are we really living in the last days? Are we right there? I believe that we are. We read the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter's reference to the end is expressed when do the Bible study. It's expressed by the perfect tense verb in the original text. It means that the action represented in the word means that it's a present reality as well as a future consequence. In other words, for Peter, when he wrote this, the end was already a present reality for the apostles. The biblical writers believe that they were in the last days. How many realize if they knew they were in the last days, here we are 2,000 years later, we better know we are in the end of the end days. Amen. So when we read the scripture, we can clearly see that the first coming of Jesus was the beginning of the end of the age. And with each passing day, we come closer to the end of all things. Now, how does this help, to help us to understand where we are in the timeline of the end times? It means that the New Testament writers, watch this closely, they viewed their times as the last days while also writing about future events of the last days. Very important. 2 Timothy 3 and 1, Paul told Timothy this. He said, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And even the opening book of Revelation, the very first chapter says this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant, John. And you know the story. John took and he transcribed those events that were shown to him by God and gave us the book of Revelation, which is a description of things, the Bible says, which must shortly take place. So I'm proving right now, guys, biblically, that we are certainly in the last days. And in verse 3 of Revelation 1, the Bible encourages us and warns us this, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Everybody say the time is near. Oh, we really are near. 
Later on at the end of this book, scripture, scripture presents us with this truth of Christ coming as an imminent reality. Jesus said it like this in chapter 22 of the book of Revelation in verse 7. He said, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. See, church, hear me out on this. Answering question one right now. Christ promised that he will come suddenly and he will come quickly. He could come for the church at any moment. I said he could come at any time. It's one reason why I'm preaching this this morning. I want us to be well aware, but also I want, I want everybody to have an opportunity to make sure that you are ready to meet the Lord. That reality leaves people today with questions that have become more prevalent here lately inside the church world and even outside of the church world because of the geopolitical climate and the constant news of the conflicts that are going in and around the nation of Israel right now. Y'all know, we used to hear a lot about the coming of the Lord in church. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But in recent decades, the message of his return can frequently get lost in the shuffle of what the Apostle Paul would characterize as empty and vain philosophies which creep their way into the church in the last days. An era, a time when the church people, the majority of the church people, won't care to deal with the hard truths of Scripture, and then they'll only want to hear about topical issues that, that deal with temporal matters and stroke their itching ears. Anybody hear me this morning? He told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, not to be intimidated when the church, when they don't want to deal with the imminent return of Jesus, but instead continue to be focused and be bold about preaching that the Lord Jesus will come, he will come quickly, and when he comes, he will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. In other words, Paul told Timothy way back then, and the message still stands for us, don't give in to the temptation to preach a populist message by only telling people what they want to hear. Tell them that Jesus is coming back. And God intends for us, church, to deal with this in the life of the church. Please read with what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4. He said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to fables. This is one of the reasons why we cannot neglect this message, in particular in the era in which we live. And when we answer the question of whether or not we're living in the last days, this scripture is probably a very good place to start. Why is that, Pastor? Well, let me, let me give you this example. While you're surfing through your podcast and checking out your favorite preachers and, and teachers and listening to messages right now, Pay close attention to the subject matter that is frequently being preached. You'll hear plenty about how you can better yourself, plenty about how you can feel better about yourself, how you can be blessed in this life, how you can better handle relationships in this life, the importance of finding happiness and fulfilling your purpose in this life. And how many are right now, you will have all the opportunities you want to hear about social issues and social justice and all manner of topics that appeal to the popular buzz issues of our day. But you might have to dig deep to find popular teaching that is really meant to ground you and fortify you in the doctrine, the solid sound doctrine of the church. This is a characteristic of the last day's church that Paul told Timothy and warned us about. That's why our focus right here in this pulpit ministry at this church will always, always be laced, filled with the fundamental truths of Scripture that we believe in and Scripture text after Scripture text that is centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ and so that you can be equipped for what you will face in this life and for the instruction that God intends for us to obey in this life. Always. 
See, church, every believer needs to know what he or she believes, and you need to know that you can articulate why you believe what you believe, especially in these last days. This is how you'll avoid, the Bible says, this is how you'll avoid being tossed to and fro by empty and deceptive philosophies which blow you around like a reed in the wind. Doctrine of the church, the Bible. What does it say? We need the word of God. Yes. Come on, I said we need the word of God. Yes. And in this era, we need solid foundations in his word like never before. Let me make this statement. Still answering number one very quickly. Church, in this last days, we need to be reminded that there are immutable, rigid, and fixed truths from Scripture that we can never neglect in our spiritual formation, none of us. And I just want to give us four of those real quick. Four of those fixed truths right now. Number one, we can never lose sight of the Great Commission. The fact that Jesus ascended to heaven, and when he did, he left his body right here, the church, on the earth with the responsibility to propel the gospel, to go out and make disciples, and prepare this world for his return. We can never, never leave out number two, and so many people don't want to talk about it these days, but number two, the rapture of the church. How many of we still believe in the rapture of the church? Come on. God will bodily resurrect the believing dead and call the living saints to meet Christ in the air and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Come on. Number three, immutable truth. We can never leave out the tribulation. I realize nobody wants to talk about these matters today, but let me declare it today and make sure we all understand it. There will be a time of great judgment on the earth with apocalyptic events so extraordinary that it will cause the population of the world to either run straight to God or rebel against God. And my favorite part, number four, we can never forget and never leave out, number four, the return of the Lord. Jesus will triumphantly return to the earth riding a white horse with his church robed in white by his side. And he will judge with eyes of blazing fire and win that final battle with the sharp sword of his spoken word. And he will rule and he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords. How many know I'm right about it this morning? Come on. Amen. Question two, here we go. What should we know about the coming of the Lord? Well, the Bible really affirms three basic facts about the coming of Christ and the end of the age. First of all, number one, I'll just declare it. I know so many people want to kind of argue about it and debate it right now, but I believe this with all of my heart. We are living, number one, we are living in the last days. Every generation of Christians have lived with the hope of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We believe that he can return for his church at any moment. And one of the reasons why we believe that is because when you study the scripture, no prophetic event remains to be fulfilled before he comes to rapture his church. In fact, certain events are occurring in our day that indicate that we're closer to the end than ever before. For example, one of the primary signs of the end of the age is the reestablishment of Israel as a nation. Look with me in Jeremiah 16, 14 and 15. This is one of the prophecies pertaining to Israel coming back to the promised land after the dispersion. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. What does that mean for me and you? Well, this is very, very significant this morning in this Bible study because it is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy that is observable in our time. You don't have to wonder about this one. When you read it in Scripture, you can look and see exactly when it took place. 
It's saying that there will come a day when they won't just talk about when Israel came up from the south, from Egypt into the promised land. That was the first Jewish migration from Egypt in Exodus. But there'll also come a day when they talk about when Israel came down from the north into the promised land. That's the second migration of, Jew, of, Jew, of Jews after World War II. Now, in the book of Isaiah and other scriptures, watch this carefully. Scriptures prophesy that this event of the return and the reestablishment will happen in one day. One day. In fact, Isaiah 66, 8 says, I'm amazed. Can a nation really be reborn in one day? Well, let me tell you this. That day happened. It was May 14th, 1948. Are y'all following me? That is a fulfillment of scripture in our observable time. The United States officially recognized the state of Israel and the deciding vote that came from, from that day was President Harry Truman, who was the deciding vote that day. Look at this picture of President Truman and this document signed by Truman. This is when he was receiving a gift from the Israeli prime minister after the establishment of Israel in 1948. And Congress had asked him to write a letter affirming that the United States supports Israel. And this is what that letter said, and this is when he was redacting the letter. He said, this government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel approved May 14th, 1948, Harry S. Truman. Isn't that interesting? This is an observable fulfillment of prophecy right here and now. On that day, Britain removed all of their troops from Palestine on that day, and 650,000 Jews were left in the land to begin to govern themselves, and a 2,500-year-old prophecy was fulfilled. And Jews began to migrate from all over the world back into the promised land at, at that time. And it's very significant that most of the Jews who migrated during that time came down from Russia because Jeremiah 16, 15 prophesied that the Lord would call them back home from the land in the north. Isn't it a wonderful thing when we can open our eyes and see God doing something right before our eyes? Another clear sign that we're living in the last days comes from Revelation 13 and Daniel 7. These are prophecies that describe a geopolitical climate on this earth that will readily accept a one world governance. It'll be led by a single head of the global state. The Bible refers to this ruler as the beast. You've heard this before. In other words, there will be a one-world government and a one-world economy. John in Revelation 13 described this leader as someone who got his authority directly from Satan. The scripture says, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his authority. Well, Pastor Brandon, what does that have to do with us right now? How does that equip us to view the signs of the times? Well, this leader will eventually be a leader of a one world government that is recognized as a sovereign over all governments of the world. It means that the nations of the world must be primed and they must be ready to give up their sovereignty in order to accommodate a one world governance. I don't know if you're looking, if you're observing and seeing what I'm seeing, but right now, church, in the age in which we live, we can clearly see nations today are becoming to be willing to give up aspects of their sovereignty to accommodate issues like climate change and income disparities and social justice and other matters. And you're seeing and hearing about the efforts and the agenda toward globalization and the global economy every single day, these are signs of the times. We cannot ignore these signs of the times. The second basic fact is this. God's timetable is not our timetable.
I, this is probably the main thing I keep having to remind people lately because everybody kind of on pins and needles and what they're hearing about, well, Israel's in the news and the bombings and this kind of thing. And I have to remind people, we don't know because God's timetable is not our timetable. But it is important for us to keep watch. But making predictions about specific dates and times is not possible. This is what Jesus said about trying to figure out when the end is. It's in Matthew 24. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But in verse 42, he said, watch, therefore. Come on, look at your neighbor right now. Come on, tell him, watch, 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 therefore, he said, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Church, you're able to identify various signs of the times, but Jesus himself even intends for us to be watchful. Here's what he said in Matthew 24, 33. He said, so you also, watch this, when you see all these things, know that the end is near. It's at the door. That's what Jesus said. It's at the door. He wants us to, watch this, guys. He wants us to have an understanding of the time frame of his return so that we'll have a heightened sense of devotion to him while we anticipate his return. But also, here's what we can't forget. It was so many don't want to think about. He wants us to have a great understanding of his coming because God wants us to have a sense of urgency about fulfilling the mission to give the gospel to the world around us. We can see the signs, but we'll never know the day or the hour. Number three, the third basic fact about the end of all things. Regardless of how long it seems to take, Christ's coming is always drawing closer. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but every day he's getting closer. The Bible emphatically declares that Christ is coming again. Luke 12 and 40 says, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And Scripture urges us to be watching, waiting, anticipating his return. What does that mean? Every day that passes by, church, is a day closer. Whether he returns tomorrow, whether he returns next week, next month, next year, or 100 years from now, we should be living every day as if we anticipate and we expect him to return today. Come on, can you receive it this morning? Question three, how can we be prepared? How can we be prepared? Well, we prepare by anticipating his return. Come on, don't put it out of your mind. When it comes to Jesus and God's will and when it comes to the promise of his return, we can't play the game of absent-mindedness out of sight, out of mind. No, God intends for us to anticipate his return. If we really believe that Jesus is coming back soon, we want to be prepared for when he comes back. Jesus illustrated this in his very own prophetic teaching about the parable of the 10 virgins. It's in Matthew 25. Here's what he said. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and Five of them were foolish. And those who were prepared had oil for their lamps so that when the bridegroom came in the middle of the night, they would be ready to go to the wedding ceremony. And when he finally came in, those who were prepared were invited, but those who were not prepared were left out. Now Jesus gave us this incredible illustration to remind us to keep watching. Be serious. Remember what the word said in 1 Peter. Be serious about watching and praying. The rapture could happen at any moment. We prepare by having our faith established upon Christ and by being watchful with anticipation of his return. Praise God. Now, in question four, I want to pause and watch this closely. There are some ways that we can look at our era in this day in which we live and kind of line things up culturally and spiritually and wonder and see and be watchful as Jesus said to be watchful. So question four, let's deal with this. What does the last days look like? 
See, the picture of biblical prophecy centers on 15 unique predictions. About half of these have already taken place or are currently taking place. I'm not going to go through all 15 today. But you can think about it like this. A timeline leading up to where we are in this life now and a timeline leading up to what's going to take place after the rapture through eternity. What does it look like? Just a few of those predictions. Number one, the spread of the gospel and growth of the church. This is in the Bible. When Jesus established his church, he promised to keep building his church until he returns. He predicted that the gospel will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Right now, every nation in the world has been reached with the gospel message and evangelization goes on every day throughout the world. This is a fulfillment of prophecy and a sign of the end days. Number two. The increase of evil and wickedness. The Bible predicts that there will be an increase of evil that will continue through the end of the age. That's Matthew 24, 12. Paul predicted that there will be perilous times in the last days that will be defined by unprecedented greed of godlessness, of selfishness. I don't know if you realize it or not, but these are prophecies that are being fulfilled today at a startling pace. Today, people don't even know the difference between good and bad, right and wrong. In fact, people are living life upside down today. They've taken the good and turned it into bad. They've taken everything that are traditionally and morally correct and right and made it into something evil and dark. This is a sign of the last days. Number three, the rise of false prophets and false religion. Jesus warned us of false Christ that will come and false prophets, Matthew 24. Peter called them false teachers. Paul called them false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. The Bible's teaching us here that in the last days, one of the signs will be that false Christianity will become more prevalent in the life of the church. We got to be on the lookout for it. Number four, we already dealt with the return of Israel to the promised land. We already mentioned this earlier, but it's part of last day's culture. Numerous Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in 1948 when Israel became a nation again after nearly 1,900 years in exile. It's one of the most significant end-time prophecies that, that has been fulfilled. And finally, number five, increase of conflicts in the Middle East. All scriptural foretellings. Jesus said it like this. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. The prophets Ezekiel and Joel in the Old Testament predicted that nations would invade Israel in the last days. Joel said it would be like multitudes in the valley of decision. See, the last day's picture of Israel is what they're back in the promised land, but they're always in the middle of some kind of conflict. The church, when all these things come to pass, we get around to what I want to get to today, and I'm about to wrap this thought up. Last day's culture, when these prophecies come to fruition, we're going to reach number six, the rapture of the church. See, at some point in the future, Jesus will return to capture the believers and take them to heaven. Aren't you glad about that? The rapture will happen in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Paul said that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those believers who are still alive will be called up to meet with them in the air and be reunited with those who've been resurrected. Come on. Sometimes people like to debate about the time frame of the rapture. Is it going to be pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? When's it going to be? But I like to rely upon what Jesus said in Revelation 3.10. Just want to leave you with this today. He said, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the world. Praise God. It's one of the biblical reasons I believe and teach that the rapture will take place before the tribulation period. And that brings me to the final point today, question five. What will happen at the rapture? Man, I want you to be so equipped with this thought today. 
What will happen at the rapture? The rapture of the church. I know we don't hear a lot about it anymore. But I can tell you this, the rapture of the church is one of the most compelling and exciting prophetic events in all of creation history. There are a few incredible prophecies in the Bible which describe the rapture of the church. But the one I want to bring out today is in 1 Thessalonians 5, excuse me, 4, 15 through 18. This is a good opportunity for you guys who like to take notes, take pictures of your notes. These are some couple of long blocks of scripture. Watch close. We're answering what will happen at the rapture. Are y'all ready for this one, guys? Come on. Here we go. For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who sleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh, come on, somebody. Anybody else looking forward to that moment in your life right there? I've been hearing about this my whole life. I don't know about you, but I can remember when I was a little kid wondering what that's going to be like. I saw an animated poster when I was a little kid. Y'all have probably seen the same poster. It's a cityscape with cars wrecking and planes crashing and a bunch of happy Christians waving. You know, hey, bye. I love that story. And I remember thinking, man, what's it going to be like? When we hear a trumpet sound, how long will it take? Are we just going to be translated right to heaven? What's it going to be like? But here, Scripture gives us an exact frame-by-frame reference of exactly what's going to happen at the rapture. I want to show it to you. We can think about the rapture as happening in five steps. Number one, Jesus will come from heaven with a shout and the sound of a trumpet. Now, I'm going to ask you right now for just a few moments as we wrap this, these thoughts up today, I want you to use your imagination. Because what I've always envisioned when I read this scripture, I already know that from other scriptures that when Jesus returns, at his returning, he's coming on a white horse. But here, he's going to be coming down as he went up, which is on a cloud. But he's going to be shouting. And I always always thought, why is Jesus going to be shouting? And I feel like he's going to be shouting because he's celebrating. Number two, watch this closely. Use your imagination. People who have died as believers will rise up and meet Jesus in the air. There will be a resurrection of the dead. Did you know that here in our denomination, we have this as one of our fundamental truths of teachings. We believe in the bodily resurrection. And number three, look at this step. Believers now who are still alive will be caught up with them in the clouds. You know, what I used to think is this when I was little. I thought, well, if people are going to come up from the dead and meet Jesus, and then those who are alive are going to go up and meet them in the clouds, I used to think, I hope that if I'm still alive, I don't see any of those people get up and rise up from the dead. I just, I just go on. <laughs> Number four, it's just steps. We will meet the Lord. I said, we will meet the Lord. Come on, somebody. Equipped for the last days. And then finally, number five, look closely. From then on, we will always be with the Lord. Come on, somebody. Come on. Ah. You know, it blows people's minds to think about this moment. But that's not all. I'm going to show you one more quick thing. But what I've gotten to is this. If we're going to observe the last day's time frame before this amazing event, we can clearly see all of the cultural conditions are in place, all of the prophecies are fulfilled, and the next thing on the timeline could potentially be the rapture of the church. 
How does that make you feel? I remember when I was little, I used to think, that's impossible. We can't live forever. How will we live and be with the Lord forever? And then it hit me, God's going to have to do something. I'm going to show it to you right now. Something very mysterious and very special has to take place in order for the rapture to work. How is it possible that we'll be made alive and live with the Lord forever? It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the last scripture of the day before we pray. Look closely. How is it possible? Paul said it like this. He said, behold, I tell you a mystery. Probably the most mysterious thing that's ever been said. <laughs> Certainly ever been written, but this is a, something that's going to happen to every person. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know, it's obvious that if somebody comes out of the grave and their bones, their decayed bones or their ashes or whatever it is, joins up with Jesus as he brings the spirit of them and collides them in the air and puts them back together again in a glorified body, that's gonna, we understand that's a change. The scripture says right here, there's going to be a different change as well. Some people are not going to die. They're not going to sleep. They're going to be alive when the rapture hits. That could be us, by the way. He said, we're not all going to sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. Pastor Brandon, what are you talking about? I said, in a moment, when Jesus comes with a shout and a trumpet to call his church to heaven, it's going to take a moment. It's like a blink, a twinkling of an eye. There's going to be a change take place. And God is going to cause the corruptible body that you have right now to be changed to an incorruptible body. And all of a sudden, the, Paul even said it's a mystery. It's a mystery. All of a sudden, so many answers get answered. How will I live forever? I understand there's a thousand year millennial reign of Jesus on the earth. After the tribulation, we might talk about this a little bit next week. Jesus is coming back. He's going to win the battle of Armageddon. He's going to establish his throne in Jerusalem. And he's going to rule the world in the flesh for a thousand years of peace on this earth. Come on, somebody. And somehow or other, the Christians who are in heaven during the marriage supper, they're coming back with him. The Bible says you will reign with him during the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus. Don't get hooked up and hung up on the fact that right now you don't live a thousand years. Because when Jesus does what he's going to do to you if you're a believer, he's going to change that old, moldy, sick, depressed, sad, discouraged, decaying body you got, and he's going to change you over to something that used to be corruptible, but now it's incorruptible. He's going to take the mortal person that you are right now. He's going to take off your mortality. He's going to dress you in immortality. Anybody getting a hold of it right now? And the Bible says this, watch closely, last scripture, verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then, everybody say then, come on. Then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Come on, come on. Come on.
It took a long way around the prophetic world, but we finally got there, didn't we? I told my wife all week long, I don't know about this Bible studies for Sunday morning. It's too much. It's too long. But I want you to be equipped and encouraged. I think I want you to be equipped with this thought. Right now, the world is looking at the Middle East. You don't always get excited about things like that because the world will say all year long, all decade long, they don't believe in God. I got into a conversation the other day at Taco Bell. Sorry, guys. I'm at Taco Bell. And I don't know how I end up in these conversations. But the guy behind the counter at Taco Bell and I were talking about salvation. Does God ever do that in your life? Yes. I just want a number nine, dude. Just number nine. That's a Mexican pizza and two Taco Supremes. Just come on. Well, if somebody's hungry for God, man, they ain't going to give you your tacos, okay? Come on. He said, but I'm, I'm an atheist, he said. I've been an atheist. What do you think about this? What's going on? I said, well, man, he said, I just can't believe that a magical God can just say poof and everything comes into existence. And I said, so let me get this straight. You can't believe that God can create everything, but somehow you can believe that nothing created everything. I said, man, it sounds like you need more faith to believe that garbage than I got in Jesus Christ. Come on. But it's amazing to me how the world will disclaim God all year long and somebody will hiccup in the Middle East and they'll start screaming, is it the end of the world? Come on. It's because they know. They know the truth. They can clearly see I think what I want you to be equipped with this morning is two things. Number one, are you ready? Are you anticipating? Because your heart is right with Jesus. And the second thing is this. Don't be afraid or intimidated when they start talking about the end. Because for me and you, if you're a believer this morning, for me and you, the end is a promise. It's not disaster. It's a promise. You know, I, I've shared so much today. I'm going to go ahead and give you one more point, and then, and then that means we can talk about Thanksgiving next Sunday. Y'all ready? What about God's covenant with Israel? Let me tell you this. God fulfills his covenant with Israel. That's fine. Here's the truth about us in Israel right here. Right now, Israel is just another false religion that's denied Jesus Christ. But God does have a covenant with them. Let me tell you how he's going to fulfill it. One way he's going to fulfill it is this. In the last days, it's going to be the greatest thumb at the nose of people that's denied him. He's going to, y'all ain't ready. After the rapture, during the tribulation, God is going to save and seal 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, and he's going to give them salvation and put a, sa a safety seal around them and give them the job of being so fired up for Jesus Christ that they sweep the whole world and more people are going to get saved by Jews preaching the gospel that have been saved in 2,000 years. He ain't done. Somebody say he ain't done. Come on. 
Don't be afraid or intimidated. Come on, y'all stand up with me. While you're standing, give God the great praise you got right now. Give him one, give him one. Come on. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with us today. And I hope today has been just such a memorable experience for you. Uh, we would love to connect with you in any way possible. And so if you'll take a look at the screen, there's a QR code that's gonna come up. Scan that with your phone and that takes you to a connect card. If this is your first time here, we would love to get to meet to you and your family. If you have any kind of need or any kind of uh, prayer request for the week, fill out that Connect card online and send it in. The staff get together. We pray together over those Connect cards every Monday. If you have any kind of comments or concerns, please write those on there as well. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. We can't wait to worship with you again. Have a great week.